Hi, Paul here. We're going to talk about templates today, designing your templates. I'm not going to go into massive detail, but I'm going to give you a few principles that I use. There are two different ways, essentially. There's similar methodologies with other doors, but I'm going to talk about logic today. Um, they're based around these two types of track stacks, the uh, folder stacks and summing stacks. And they both have their advantages and disadvantages. I'm going to outline a few of those now. So in this template, which I use for this particular track, um, I'm using summing stacks. First of all, you can select a number of tracks if you want to create a stack out of your vocal takes or whatever. Um, and then you go, you either right click and here you can say create track stack um, or it's up here in the in the menu as well, tracks, uh, create track stack. And the difference between the two types of stack are in the summing stacks, you're summing the audio, whereas with the folder stacks, you're just organizing the uh, individual channels. So with a folder stack, you do get a VCA, you can control the overall volume um, and the mute and solo, but you but you don't get the all of the stuff that you get here, like you've got sends here, you can send to all your different kind of uh, channels and create buses and all that kind of stuff, and you can put actual effects on as well. Now, there is one big disadvantage with summing stacks currently in Logic, which is if you have a lot of uh, plugins, um, VSTs, AUs, uh, you know, virtual instruments, whatever, within a stack, they will all load when you click on the actual stack kind of header, the, the main channel. Um, and if you're using dynamic loading, which I always do, so your session opens immediately, only the, the tracks, you know, if you flick down here and see tracks that have uh, parts in, only those tracks load the instruments. Um, everything else just stays unloaded until you click on it. Brilliant. But in this view, I think it doesn't happen in the mixer view, uh, weirdly, but in this view, if you do make, have the misfortune of clicking on the stack, um, it will load everything and you'll be sat there for a few minutes waiting. Now, the the uh, other thing that can can cause that is if you're working within the stack and you forget and click this little triangle to, to hide the stack, it will select the main channel, which will load everything in there. So that's a, a little warning, a little disadvantage. But if we go in and look um, at the way that I've organized this, and I'm not gonna go into crazy detail, but I'll just give you the principles. The way that I've set this template up uh, and people often wonder about whether to pre-organize this. So you've got a bunch of stuff ready. Um, I like to have some some basic effects and uh, sometimes a delay up it, within all of my um, folders, my sorry, my stacks um, in order to save time constantly going in and setting things up. So I've preset all of this, but I'm doing it in a kind of brower eyes way. So. If you don't know what that is, Google, there's loads of really great videos on that. Greg Wells talks about it a lot. And the Michael Brower way of sending um, lots of uh, sending lots of your tracks into um, different kind of signal chains, which might be compressors or um, EQs or whatever, but as a whole, and then summing all the outputs of those individual buses as the output so that you can blend sounds together and have them all treated in the same way. Now, I use a similar approach here. For example, here, I'm sending uh, my individual VIs to one of these four main kind of channels. There's a winds long bus, a winds short bus, because you often treat those two things slightly differently. Uh, they have different amounts of a, a short note will often create a more dynamic and longer sounding reverb tail in a room than a long note. Um, so you sometimes want to put a little bit more reverb on the long notes to balance them up. And I'll have a special effect channel for my hero uh, soloist instrument that might have loads of reverb um, and then a fourth one. So it gives me a certain amount of flexibility. And then of those channels, I'm sending those to uh, effects chains, which are here, these five different effect treatments. So here you might see, for example, on the on the soloist channel, I'll send my soloist into 103, bus 18. That will then send out to these two effects loops, which are a cinematic rooms and then a separate H delay going into a very long EOS 2 reverb. 
And the combination of those sounds is something that I really like. And it gives me a much more, a much richer and more colourful sound in the, in the long run. Now, these can get super complicated and you can put effects on the actual, on the, on the kind of pre-send, if you like, the kind of pre-bus that is collecting all of those instruments together. All the shorts, for example, you might want to put some kind of treatment over all of them before they start going to the effects. Um, and it gives you a ton of flexibility. The other way you can bypass this altogether by sending, uh, and if we find, if we go to my drum tracks, I've done this on the on the drum channels. I'm I'm using here because I want to get a little bit more um, a little bit more detailed control. I'm just sending directly, for example, here to you can see here buses 91, 92, 93. And these three treatments that I've got, I'm bypassing my brow eyes thing. So it's it's one of those things that you've got it set up and then you can approach it two different ways. You've got the creativity of being able to, um, you know, even within the same session of approaching your effects treatment and your processing of the sounds. And this is all super important because it's all stuff that adds to the character of the sound that you're producing. So it's not about just loading up a, a bass drum sound and then just using it or putting a bit, bit of EQ on it. It's about finding a, a real character in the sound and bringing that character out. And there are, uh, for some of these drums, for example, are, I, I've sent some of them out um, and back in. So you can see there's a couple of bounce in place tracks um, where I might have done some treatment. Uh, I might have had a, an IO going to get a bit of outboard on something and then bring it back into the session and uh, use it from there. So if we actually go to the drums in the main view, uh, I should tidy this session up a little bit, you'll see um, that there are some channels. Let's see. Yeah, there are some channels here where, for example, this one uh, has been bounced through some outboard. So. Let's start with the drums. I'm going to give you a very quick example of a bit of this uh, stuff. We'll solo, where have we got? So we've got some interesting bits and bobs in here. I'll just solo all of these tracks and give you a quick blast and we'll get the mixer back up. And you can see that I'm really, I'm really carefully, you know, finding the character of each of the sounds here. So you get the idea and it's really, um, if I unsolo, I mean, we can pick a couple of these sounds. I would just pick this one, for example. And if I, if I solo it and then I'll just turn all the processing off and you can have a listen. So there's a couple of little uh, drum samples that I've used in there and they, and it just doesn't, until you add all of the stuff in, You know, you've got to find the character in every sound and really just fine tune it. Um, and I've done, I've kind of combined two different approaches here. Um, they're very, very similar, but this is, these are my own organic recordings. So if I, if I highlight this track, let's find where the notes are. So you can see they're kind of scattered all over the place, um, but they are, they're sounding uh, really nice. And that's all getting that processing. And it's just a natural, um, if I turn all of that off. So you can see I'm not using any of the effects on here. Uh, it's just, it's just raw. And it's all stuff that I recorded myself. I mic'd up the kit and recorded, had the track running and I just recorded a whole bunch of stuff and it's all kind of in there, you know. <laughs> um, so that's my kind of dub break source patch. And that's part of the download with that comes with the with the album. Um, that's my little plug. But if you then go back to here and we put the effects all back on, and I'll show you the four effects I'm using. Timeless. Uh, I've got uh, the fatso to just give it a bit of punch. 
Um, nice bit of pro R there, and then really carving the sound to give it the character that I want it to, to have. So that's, that's a quick look at um, how some of that stuff works. And it might be even that, for example, here on, on this uh, particular drum sound, And you can see that I've got, I, I use different, I, I kind of combine different sounds. So like I've got a number of different bass drum sounds that I'm using and some of them are fulfilling certain jobs. Some of them are just doing little cross rhythms. Some of them are just kind of, you know, filling in the sub area. Um, and it's all part of getting that character. But as you can see, this approach gives me quite a lot of flexibility in how I'm gonna treat all of the different sounds. Now, the one thing that's in common to both templates is if we look at here, the live stack, I'll always have a bunch of channels that are set up and it could be just with a microphone um, ready to go. It could be just a single input with no treatment on it whatsoever. It might be that you've got things going through specific, you know, you might have a couple of mics set up with different uh, preamps on them. Uh, even going through a, an outboard compressor before it get, hits the, the actual channel. Um, I've got the output of my uh, Helix in here so that I could use, you know, really easily just plug a guitar in and off you go. Um, and here, oh look, there, here we go. So that's the drum kit um, channels coming into the session and that though, that's all the material that then became the kind of dubby stuff once I'd mixed it. So, it's really useful to have that stuff set up so that when you get a an idea, you can really quickly go in, switch a channel on, and just grab an instrument and play. Um, and then you can you can once you've captured the idea, you can refine, you can set up a different mic, whatever it is. But the key thing is to keep working fast, and th and that's what um, my template enables me to do. Now I know there are. Also advantages to starting with a total blank page, which means that you're not gonna kind of go for the sounds that you have preloaded in your template, and maybe you think a bit more before you load a new instrument. But to be honest, I like to have something set up, you know, th there's a, such an advantage to having things like this, all of these channels ready to go, ready to open. And even in the, in the synth area, uh, where you've got um, here in the synth stack, you know, I've got all my favorite synths. You see all the usual suspects, the uh, incredible Dark Zebra, um, the Repro, the Yuhi stuff. I love Yuhi stuff. Uh, I haven't used Serum in this. Phobos, so many incredible sounds in Phobos. And then some some stuff from um, Olafur Arnold's. Uh, and then a few outboard things. So, you know, there'll be things where I'm using, uh, for example, my SE1X is an out, outboard synth. It's a really great bass synth. And then there's some stuff that I've just kind of played in. Um, so it, that's kind of like the synth equivalent of having your mic channel set up. So everything's ready to go. It does take a bit of preparation, but once you've done it once, you can then adapt that template to other jobs. So you can just drag whole, bun whole kind of chunks of it into a new session and create a new template derived from the settings in the old template. So, what is the other approach? So this track's called Ballet of the Snow. Uh, it's another track on the record that the fabulous cellist Tina Guo played on for me. Um, and this I set up the template in a different way because I knew that it was gonna be more, the way that I was treating most of the individual tracks is more naturalistic. So. Um, I didn't need all of the extra kind of processing power and, and detail of all of those different ways of routing effects and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, for example, here, this folder track stack, you can see literally just has VCA, mute and solo. And that's it. And when you click on it, it doesn't load every single uh, <laughs> item within the stack, which is just fabulous. It's so much easier. Uh, and quicker to work around. And if we go to the mixer, I have tidied this up a little bit uh, just to get rid of, just to make it easier to navigate around. But you can see I'm just uh, within my stack, the way that I've set this up, let's open another one. 
I've set up a uh, reverb at the beginning, which things can refer back to. So that has its own bus here, bus 12. And then within the actual instruments in the stack, they all send to bus 12. That bus 12 comes out the same um, bus as all of the others. They still are stemmable at the far end. So you can see that I've got my uh, record stems and my listening stems, and my, my listening stems here. Um, and you can see, I think I did a video about, about the de in detail about this template, but you can then also see the print stems are here as well. So when I need to print something to get those stems separately, everything is already rooted and it's super easy and ready to go. But um, I keep everything super simple. And then when I do have a requirement to have maybe a couple of different treatments on something, so if I just look for something here, for example, for keys, um, I've preset this up so that everything has a send ready to go and it goes to one of these three channels. Um, and they are, you know, a, a kind of general reverb, a super long reverb, and then something bouncy, which in this case is Echo Boy. So I can blend those together from here and set the amount that I'm sending. For example, on a nursery, Solstice Nursery channel here, it's got uh, that kind of thing. It's also got a golf os on there because I wanted to uh, only focus on a certain part uh, of that sound. So that is kind of pulling things in a little bit. I'll say a little bit. It's taming quite strongly and then pulling the brightness down as well just to so it doesn't overpower the other stuff. So that is the alternative approach. Um, you know, it, I've got a lot of the same sounds in the template. So I'm using, you know, there will be things where, like my wine glasses here that I use. Um, again, those are uh, in the Journeys uh, sample pack. But I'm using, it's really more about the kind of workflow. I guess the first template gives you a, more of a kind of record production workflow. This is really, this probably sounds really stupid. It's in my mind. It's the way that, you know, large format desk, uh, lots of routing opportunities and a kind of comp fine dialing in a, you know, complexity of sound and richness of sound. Whereas this is much more about um, starting with a kind of more naturalistic sound. Although, ironically, I did actually go for a very... Uh, a very specific kind of sound on this track to put it into a kind of frozen world kind of feel, a kind of slightly otherworldly feel. Um, and I'm using ozone on this and I'm not doing it in a crazy way. Um, I'm doing it in a quite subtle way because I then wanted to give uh, Sicily the opportunity to, you know, to do them to master the track and, and just, you know, dial stuff in a little bit uh, on, at her end. So, but interesting, you'll see that the Ozone has replaced a couple of the UAD Precisions, the L3. Um, one of the things that I've done on a few of these tracks is I'm a recent convert to the Slate VSX headphones. Um, and I don't use them on everything, but one thing that I find them really, really useful for is to, is to just, when I think I've got the mix pretty close, I put it up, and I listen to some of the different rooms and I flick between the rooms and just listen to how it sounds coming out of different kind of model sets of speakers in different model rooms. And usually what will happen is I'll hear something that doesn't sound quite right. And it, it, I find that that gives me, um, you know, I'm not a Michael Brower or a Greg Wells or JJ Puig. I don't have those ears that are kind of super powered. I don't think of any other way of putting it. Um, and so I need a bit of help. And, and this is the way that I find easiest because I, if I, if something bothers me in the mix in one of those model rooms, then I should probably dial it back in a bit and, um, and see if I can fix it. And once I've got it sounding good in as many of those different models as possible, then I kind of think, okay, that's as close as I can get it. Um, and you know, at that stage, it goes to uh, Sicily to master and Sicily will look at anything and see if there's anything that that needs fixing from that mastering perspective for, for the, you know, to get it translating as well as possible across as many different uh, 
rooms as possible and, and playback systems. But you can see here the vocal stem, which has got Tina's cello coming back through. Um, I've really, uh, I don't, I've kind of gone to town a, a little bit on it. It still sounds like a cello. <laughs> I wanted to make it a character in this snowstorm that you can kind of see and it's singing through. It's not like it's quiet or anything, but I wanted to give it a slightly different, slightly different twist on the actual sound so it wasn't too naturalistic. So that's my my little uh, channel here. You know, there's a few little things. That's super simple. Um, I just put the Neve on because it adds just even <laughs> even just running it through the model without really too much on. It's got a little bit of compression on, but not too much. Obviously, a bit of bounce and then my reverb. And this is one of those few occasions where you've got a heroin instrument and you want it to, you want to get the treatment exactly right just on that channel. So I wasn't worried about, you know, I wouldn't go through putting reverbs on every single channel, as I've explained, that kind of stuff. For most of the instruments, uh, you can group them together and, and get everything sounding lovely. So, um, that's the that's the two approaches. But as you can see, even though I've tidied up the session, you know, in my live stem, I've still got this uh, stem of performed cymbal swells, which I recorded live. I do record, you know, I do kind of put stuff in live uh, as and when I just want a bit more control over it than you can typically get. Or, you know, I, it's just nice to have a blend of, of naturalistic live sounding things and things that are kind of maybe slightly arch in their presentation, like the um, these lovely glass glockenspiels, which you can take them and then you can kind of really give them a, an identity within the track. Uh, and as you can see, I've got plenty of bouncy reverb -y effects, even though these are recorded in air studios, so they really are soaked in reverb. Um, but playing that just reminds me, there's one other element to this. Now, I try to get my template sounding as good as possible, as close as possible to the finished track as I go, so that I'm inspired to play better and come up with better ideas. There's a downside to that, which is that you sometimes end up getting, you build up a latency and it makes it harder to play into the session. But it's super simple. On uh, here, customize control bar and display, you can set up all those different things that you want. And one of those things that I always, always, always have set up is low latency monitoring. And you just click that and then it removes any plugins with loads of latency and you've got. And you're kind of close to the sound that you were hearing before, but it's immediate. You can feel, you know, you're back to playing and hearing at the same time as opposed to. That which has got that slight delay. So excitingly, and earlier than I thought, I've got some CDs. How about that? So I'm going to start. I've got to just get my head around. I know I'd put set a, a release date, official release date of April the 16th, but I'm going to start sending these out earlier. And um, I just need to get my head around the process of the the postage system. It's all set up. Um, but it's obviously uh, the first time I've done it. So <laughs> I'll get into a flow and then they'll all be winging their way out. But um, it's kind of ridiculously uh, exciting to have the actual physical physical thing in my hand. Um, and I have got the first track that I'm releasing to streaming um, is available now to pre-save in Spotify. And that is the final track on the album, which is Nocturne. It's a very stylized, but I think beautiful, um, peaceful, but harmonically interesting piano piece. Um, and I thought it's kind of interesting and in a slightly perverse way to, to open <laughs> streaming with the final track on the record. But it seemed to be a good one to start with. So we'll see what happens. And I think the way that I'm gonna do this I'll probably release three or four tracks from the record over a period of um, you know weeks, a couple of months maybe, um, and then I will put the uh, the full thing up. But I'm but for now um, you can get it on the on the shop, but also as a digital download if you don't want to um, get this shipped out to you. Um, and there's the little sample library that I put together that comes with it. So. 
There we go. That's my sales pitch. Um, the streaming thing is quite interesting, and I'm going to show you how it goes. I'm starting with a, a brand new, baby fresh uh, <laughs> streaming <laughs> identity because I had to tidy up. I, when I looked at uh, uh, my presence on Spotify and Apple Music and all that stuff, I was like, oh, this is a total mess. And half the stuff up there isn't me. Um, misattributed and all kinds of stuff. So I've sorted that out. For the most part, it's um, it's in progress. And um, I'm starting with, as you can see, zero listeners. <laughs> so uh, I actually noticed that I just changed my um, link tree. I put a link tree up yesterday with this pre-save and I've now got four listeners. So uh, overnight, I've picked up four new listeners. So I'm very excited about that. Not that there's anything to listen to yet, um, but there will be very soon. It's uh, the 26th of March, next Tuesday, um, it will be uploaded, the first single, and ready to listen to. So I look forward to getting uh, feedback to see what you think as I'll release each new track. I'll talk about it a little bit. And uh, yeah, we'll share this journey together. And we'll see um, We'll see where we get to see if we can get into double digits on the listener count. That would be exciting. <laughs> um, but I'm having a lot of fun. And uh, while, you know, I'm incredibly busy, obviously, with Spitfire stuff, this is my kind of uh, little side passion project of being able to put some of my own music out into the world as well. So thanks for coming on this journey with me. We are going to dive into um, creating your own sample library the next time. Now, I don't know a lot about merch. Um, you know, there's obviously you can make T-shirts, you can do posters, there's all kinds of different things. This has become really apparent that this is the only area of growth in uh, in the music industry as a whole, the only significant area of growth. Um, even as streaming starts to drop off now, weirdly, sales of, uh, of physical product, whether it's vinyl, CD or whatever, um, with something extra, something special added, whether it's, you know, like I say, some kind of merch or um, experience or whatever, that is growing again as we're becoming more interested in really connecting with the people whose music we love. Um, so I think it's interesting. And the thing that, you know, the thing that we can do as kind of, you know, these uh, kind of pseudo scientific musicians, composers sitting in our darkened rooms is we can make sounds as well. And maybe that's an extra element to merge that you might consider and we'll see how it goes. But that's what that's what I've done for this. So I'm going to show you how I did it and how easy it is to program up um, your own little sample library in contact. Uh, and that will be the subject of the next video. So stay tuned, click the thingy, ding the bell, whatever it is, subscribe, <laughs> subscribe and like, uh, and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.